What's cracking? Brand new vid just blacked in. Big dogs! Welcome bike to the channel. Welcome bike to the headquarters. My name is Nicholas. This is BDGE. This is a brand new t-shirt manufacturer that we're working with and the tees are crispy like some fucking chicken fingers bigdogsfantasy.com go grab some merch today we're gonna round out the last of my wide receiver rankings i don't even know how many we're gonna rip off today i'm sick of rankings i i don't even really like doing rankings to be honest with you but i'm gonna give you my best don't you worry about that 2020 wide receiver fantasy football rankings and then we get into the fun shit then summer starts then i get to put myself on the line telling you guys that i hate guys that i love the guys that y'all are gonna smear my good name with over the next year and i'm looking forward to it there's nothing more i love than a good schmear job i don't know about y'all but i'm certainly ready it's time to tuck our shirts in it's time to stop yelling it's time to eat All right, all right, all right. Now that we spoke to Dr. Morse of the Fantasy Doctors, if you missed last week's episode or the episode before that, we broke down quarterbacks, running backs, wide receivers, tight ends, total on the pie, total on the pie that we are nervous about for the 2020 season when it comes to injuries. We talked about Matthew Stafford, and Dr. Morse says he has very, 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 very little concern for Matt Stafford. I believe he put it at a two and a half or a three out of 10 in terms of his injury rating for 2020. If Matt Stafford's okay, Kenny Galladay is double, triple, OG okay with me. Kenny Galladay is our wide receiver eight for 2020 fantasy football, currently going off the board at the 303 as the wide receiver eight. A lot to break down with Kenny G, though. A lot of context, I think, to wrap around before y'all get excited about it and before I get overly excited about it. So last year, we take a step bike, we look at what Kenny G did. Finishes as a wide receiver five overall, half PPR. For more context, you look at the fantasy points that he scored in 2019 that had him at wide receiver five. If you took the same amount of fantasy points, put that into 2018, he would have finished outside of the top 10 as a fantasy wide receiver. It was an overall down wide receiver year for everybody in fantasy, not named Michael, Mikey, Mikey Boy Thomas. But there's still plenty of love about Kenny Galladay. I'm not shitting on the parade. I just like to play devil's advocate. I want you to see this side. I want you to see this side. And then y'all can make the informed choices afterwards. He had that typical third year wide receiver breakout that we tend to see in the NFL. 65 catches on 119 targets. 1190 yards and a gorgeous 11 touchdowns so he finally operated as a true alpha for the first time in his career we have to be excited about matt stafford coming back because you look at the splits with matt stafford on the left without matt stafford on the right 15.4 half ppr fantasy points per game as opposed to 11.75 he takes a four point jump up in just about every scoring category more receptions, more touchdowns, more targets, more receiving yards. However, when we look at the actual target total from last year, 119 targets. That is very low for an alpha, especially an alpha on a team who was in the top half of the league in passing, passing plays per game, as well as passing rate overall. So the percentage of their overall plays that were passes. They didn't have a running back of consequence that caught passes. Their wide receiver too, Marvin Jones, was banged up for a lot of the year. He missed like over, over a month of the year. You have a tight end uh, and a rookie who was not a tight end of consequence catching passes either. So if I told you all in, this, in the preseason, all of that context, right? Kenny G is going to be the alpha in this offense. He will lead the team in targets. They don't have a running back catching passes they don't have a tight end catching passes marvin jones is going to miss a month of the season i would say that kenny g should be chalked up for at least 140 targets on the year again didn't do that and before you say blah, 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 jeff driscoll david blau was under center they they really didn't throw up much lower of a rate when those guys were under center as compared to stafford it was just 1.5 fewer pass attempts per game with those guys on the field so when it comes to efficiency sure he would have been much better with Stafford on the field when it comes to the volume I'm still a little bit weary about that 119 targets overall and we'll get to that in a sec what happens when you have that low of a target total number is that you get very inconsistent week over week production last year Kenny G had five games over 115 yards 11 games with fewer than 75 yards zero 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 in between the 11 touchdowns obviously kind of kept him afloat and kept him in that fantasy stud range again though a lot of those games were with Stafford I believe four out of the five games he went over 115 yards were within those first eight games on the flip side the type of player Kenny G is he doesn't need 150 targets to be great in fantasy because he's so good 
in the end zone. He's so big. He's such a wide catch radius, and he's an incredible downfield threat. And going off of Matt Stafford, like he was not afraid to sling that ball last year. This was something I tweeted out, I believe, after eight weeks into the season. Matt Stafford's currently on pace to attempt 112 deep balls this year per PFF. Quarterback leaders in deep ball attempts over the last 10 years, as you could see, none of them would have matched Matt Stafford's pace, and most of them were well, well, well below. So despite, you know, Bevel coming in and we were worried about him and Matt Patricia being there, they did not hold him back whatsoever. And Matt was slaying the ball. So as long as he's healthy, I'm okay with that because he's taking so many shots downfield to Kenny G. Look at his receiving stats. First in the NFL in deep targets, tied for first in deep receptions, second in deep yards, tied for first in touchdowns of 40 plus yards, first in average depth of target. 42 wide receivers with over 85 targets. So he is top one or two in basically every deep statistic category. And he's built like an elite deep threat, built at 6'4", 224 pounds. So I think there's a few things to work off of here, right? We do have Stafford getting back, which is extremely exciting for Kenny Galladay owners. And that means the efficiency will probably be up. I think we'll see an overall boost to Galladay's targets. I just don't know if it's going to be that much higher than the 120 you saw last year. Marvin Jones will be back healthy. Hawkinson will hopefully take a step into his second year as his tight end. You know, number eight overall draft capital. They're going to have some sort of plan for him to get more acclimated into the offense this year they draft a a great pass catching back in DeAndre Swift so to to be quite frank again I I don't know how big of a step up we see from Kenny G in terms of those targets overall and this was something that I tweeted out a couple days ago Kenny Galladay had 116 targets last year the lowest number of any top five fantasy wide receiver in 2019 the lowest targeted wide receiver that finished as a top five fantasy wide receiver over the last whatever that is seven years 2018 137 148 152 158 150 130, 142, 138. So he was by far and away the lowest target total number for anyone to finish in the top five fantasy wide receivers in a long, long time. So if you want to bet on that, I wouldn't say that's smart money. Maybe he does get more targets coming into his fourth year as the true alpha there. What I think we might end up seeing, I think what we're going to see in terms of like analysis going forward, especially closer to the season. I mean, if you follow me first off, you know, I'm not a big schedule guy. I don't look at schedules in fucking May and June and try to tell you which defenses are going to be good because it shifts so drastically year over year. But I think we're going to see a lot of things where blog posts and podcasts talking about how Kenny G is going to be a great buy low candidate over the first month of the se- after the first month of the season because he's got some difficult matchups the first five weeks of the season. He's got the Chicago Bears. He's at Green Bay. He's at Arizona, who's got Patrick Peterson, obviously probably shadowing him, New Orleans Saints, and then a bye. So tough matchups, tough defenses on the road, then his bye. And then after that is fucking wheels up. He comes back from the bye. Jacksonville. Falcons, Colts, Vikings, Redskins, Panthers, Texans. That might be the easiest slate of wide receiver matchups over a seven-week period that you could find in the NFL. So keep this in mind. I'm sure I'll bring it up as we get closer to the season. Kenny Galladay, my wide receiver eight. As you can feel by the way I'm talking about him, it seems like there's probably a little bit of a tier gap between the three guys I talked about in my last video, which I will link in the description, and where Kenny Galladay is at. Just because the volume was so low, I don't have that much confidence that we'll see the number jump up so highly. So that's why you're hearing a little bit of hesitation behind my voice. Number nine, Adam Thielen out in Minnesota. Current ADP of wide receiver 16 at the 408. I find it really, really hard to leave Adam Thielen out of the discussion in this area. Like, this isn't dynasty. This is redraft. This is one year. Diggs is out of the picture. He was the clear, clear number two there. You, Thielen was always operating as the alpha. Imagine any objective situation where you have the alpha, Adam Thielen, and then you have the clear number two, and he's gone. Why would the alpha not be looked at as such a a ridiculously good pick the following year? So you already know that Thielen and Kirk Cousins have this chemistry, right? It doesn't matter what kind of fucking offseason we have. We could have have literally no offseason. They could cut the first four weeks of the damn season, and Thielen and Kirk arguably have some of the best chemistry in the NFL. And I'm not willing to write off Thielen because of last year. I know he's old, but he is not someone who's played for 10 years. He, like, just came on a few years ago. You look at last year, Thielen dealt with a lot of injuries. This team was extremely run-heavy. I think if we take the injuries into context you'll see the right piece of analysis when it comes to Adam Thielen for this year he suffered a hamstring strain in week seven I want to look at the splits he played a total of 10 games last year look at weeks one through six then he suffers the hamstring strain in week seven 14.3 half PPR points per game last year that would have been number five wide receiver five behind Julio 
The hamstring injury, again, I'm telling you, it ruined his year because he missed a bunch of time. He ended up returning too soon, got injured again, and it ruined the entirety of the second half of the year for him. So if there's anyone I'm not concerned about this year in terms of injury, in terms of what happened last year, it is Adam Thielen. The only thing that they have in this passing game that they added to the passing game is Justin Jefferson. The entire passing game is going to be centered around Thielen. I don't know how much you could really buy into the fact that you expect a rookie like Justin Jefferson to get super involved in this offense. I would be shocked if we don't see Thielen near the 28 to 30 percent target share mark and for a guy that you're getting his ADP is 408 and this is not even in super flex ADP I believe so you're probably getting him in the early fifth round at I believe he's a ridiculously ridiculously good pick here and even if they do go more two tight end sets which I know a lot of people are going to be fucking clamoring about more two tight end sets he only ran 30 percent of his routes from the slot last year so I'm not concerned about that he is not a guy who gets pigeon he's not Cooper Cup where he's only really primarily good in the slot he's someone that can operate on the outside he's a big long he's also a deep threat guy like he could play all over the field and he will be fine again only 30 percent of his routes last year came from the slot so put him outside i don't really care run heavy still this offense probably kirk throws the ball 30 times a game you know what 30 percent target share is of 30 pass attempts a game it's 140 to 150 targets on the year and imagine imagine if they are not as run heavy as they were last year maybe they will be what if dalvin cook holds out they don't have a running back that they want to give the ball 28 times a game they go a little bit more run pass heavy what if they don't have games where kirk cousins attempts six to eight pass attempts a game they're going to go a little bit more pass heavy so i would say 140 target mark for Adam Thielen this year is probably on the lighter side. And I might have to move him up after this analysis because every fucking time I do these videos, I end up doing that. So let's move on. Adam Thielen, my number nine. Amari Cooper, my number 10. He's currently going off the board as the wide receiver 10, current ADP of 310. So my math is correct. That's 34th overall. I like Cooper a lot this year. And I've been talking about him as a very easy sell candidate in Dynasty, but this is where this is where things are going a little loopy here because I, we you know, we've been putting out so much Dynasty content and basically all offseason. If you're into fantasy football at this point, which I feel like a lot of my audience has kind of shifted over to that, you've been following Dynasty content. So you're getting sucked into the narratives that are very 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 Dynasty focused. This is redraft, y'all. It's becoming to the point where Amari Cooper is is going to be a buy in season long leagues where he's going. So you look at the narratives. They draft C.D. Lamb. He's a rookie. Even if he does outperform his expectations as a rookie, which I actually think he's going to do, the Cowboys have the second most targets opened up in their offense with Randall Cobb gone, with Jason Witten gone. He can literally take Randall Cobb's production from last year, C.D. Lamb, who had almost 850 yards. And Cooper can still ball. That won't affect Cooper's numbers. We're also like thinking about this narrative, like, oh, they drafted CeeDee Lamb to replace Amari Cooper in two years. Like, I don't think that they were like, oh, in the executive office, like, I can't wait to use our first round pick so that we can replace Amari Cooper. Also not a relative narrative to the season long thing. It doesn't matter. He's going to be here. He's going to be 25, 26 years old this season in the prime of his career. This is an extremely potent offense. Dak just threw for over 4,900 yards. They had the third highest pace of all NFL teams on the offense. Thanks to Kellen Moore. They bring in Mike McCarthy who is a pass first pass happy head coach we've seen him do wonders for fantasy wide receivers while he was in green bay i mean i could list off like seven fucking names for you right now who he made really really good fantasy wide receivers and i think amari amari cooper fits the mold for what he wants so don't make the mistake of falling into all these dynasty narratives because that's the content that you've been consuming over this offseason and we could talk about inconsistency and i do think there is some there is some kind of delta here between the talent and the inconsistency. And we did talk to Dr. Morse about his injuries. He's had a lot of them and he's had this plantar fasciitis with apparently he's probably been dealing with for like four or five years now. We don't really know when it's going to spur up. He doesn't think that the injuries have, has been what's been really causing him the inconsistencies in play. Again, I ain't no fucking doctor and he is, but I feel like they do kind of play a part here. So if you want to fade Cooper because of the injuries, I 100% am okay with that. But I do think the upside is worth it because we saw what he was doing last year in the beginning of the season, the first month the first month of the season, he was bawling the fuck out. And then all of a sudden, this ghost MRI came in. He needed to get his knee MRI, a fucking ankle MRI. He bruised his quad, his hamstring strain. Like before you know it, like 13 injuries added up. And then shit went downhill. So I think at the very, very basis of the argument, for 2020, Amari Cooper is the alpha in this Cowboys passing all offense, which is a very, very, very Hawaiian tree bark potent fucking offense. Don't think too hard about this one. Number 11, one we do need to think hard about, and this is one I discussed uh, deeply with Dr. Morse, and that is Cooper Cup of the Los Angeles Rams, currently going off the board as wide receiver 15. So I have him a lot higher than consensus. 43rd overall at the 4 
2007. His final stat line last year was extremely impressive. 94 catches, 1,161 yards, 10 receiving touchdowns. But the season was a true fucking Game of Thrones-esque type year. So good, finished so fucking bad. Weeks one through eight, eight games. Cup tops, 100 yards, five separate times. Sees eight plus targets in seven of eight games. Double digit targets in five of eight games, including target total games of 12, 15, 17. And let's not forget that week eight game right before their buy, seven catches, 220 yards and a tug. I'm gonna repeat that. Two, two, fucking zero. 220 receiving yards on seven catches. Then the buy hits like a fucking tab of acid and things get funky. He finishes, I mean, he finished, he finished strongly because he scored a touchdown in five straight games to end the year, but his involvement in the offense was weird. His production was much lower outside of just touchdowns. You've probably heard me talk about this already, but we're diving into Cooper Cup specifically today. So I want to talk about the Rams offense again. I've made the argument. The Rams had a very bad offensive line last year. Somehow they went from the, an elite offensive line to one of the worst in the NFL. When that happens... What do you do? You have to put an extra blocker on the line in the form of a tight end. You're not going to put six offensive linemen out there. It's not how it works. So you go to 12 personnel, which means two tight ends on the line. So they've been running three wide receiver sets since McVay has come in the league. That was what other teams could not figure out. Three wide receivers, one tight end, one running back. Offensive line blocks poorly. You got to throw another tight end in there. That means only two wide receivers are on the outside. So Cup mathematically goes from playing the slot, and there's only two wide receivers, both of them got to be on the outside. He becomes an outside guy. From weeks one through eight, Cup ran 75.3% of his routes from the slot. He didn't have a single game in which he ran more routes outside than inside the slot. Not a single game in which he ran more than 18 routes on the outside. By week hits, weeks 10 through 17. I'm going to run those stats. Bike, same number of games. Five games of 21 plus snaps outside. Not a single game of 18 plus weeks one through eight. Five games of 21 plus outside. Three games running more snaps outside than in the slot. His overall slot percentage dropped from 75.3 to 57.8%. He also overall ran 10% fewer snaps over the second half of the season. He was an 85% snap guy weeks one through eight, dropped down to 75% weeks 10 through 17. And we discussed this with Dr. Morse. He definitely thinks that the ACL could have played a factor in terms of just overall fatigue. Because we remember he tore his ACL late in the 2018 season. He comes back. Yes, all the reports are really good. He came off extremely strong strong it's possible it was some of the offense it's possible it was some of the game plan it's also possible that cup was hitting a little bit of fatigue now he's two years removed from the acl which is why we want to buy him robert woods tyler higby became the alphas over the second half of the year we know that but here's what i'll say now that he's two years removed he'll be stronger than ever brandon cooks is gone not that he was a major factor last year but now you go into the year knowing who the two outside alpha wide receivers are and it's just woods it's just cooper cup as opposed to like playing a guessing game like we did last year the other thing to consider here is just the chemistry right we talk about adam thielen and kirk cousins chemistry jared goff and cooper cup especially 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 in the end zone in the red zone it's beautiful it it really there's not many things i want to say about jared goff and combine him with the word beautiful but like connection between goff and cooper cup in the red zone in the end zone beautiful last year cooper cup top five in overall 10 zone targets 16 touchdowns he scored over his previous 23 games i think he's a good bet to catch i think he's a good bet to finish with a similar stat line that he did last year hopefully you get it with a little bit more consistency over the course of the year 90 catches i think he he ends up with probably finishes with between eight and ten touchdowns so in the round four and it's same thing with like Adam Thielen man if you're on the turn if you're on that like late fourth early fifth round turn and you you stack up your running backs early two studs in round one and two at the running back position maybe a tight end or a quarterback in round three if you're in a super flex and then you can get like Cooper Cup and Adam Thielen as your wide receiver one and two they're kind of just like inverse of each other whatever doesn't matter which one you put where you're gonna be sitting fucking pretty because I think both these guys are incredible incredible values that offer legit that'll probably finish inside the top 12 or the top 10 that you can get outside of those drafting spots so Cooper Cup is my wide receiver 11. And I'll tell you what, man, there was just, there was a lot of wide receivers I wanted to put at 12. Mike Evans, there's Juju, there's Allen Robinson, there's Cooper Cup's teammate, Robert Woods, there's OBJ. Uh, I think a lot of people could argue that Robert Woods might be, might belong over Cooper Cup just based on how he finished. I'm not ready to take him straight up over Cooper Cup, but I think if you get him around two rounds later, I think it's a good arbitrage play. As for the other guys, I haven't made my mind up yet. I'm gonna be straight with you. I am gonna get my first rendition, probably the top 100 rankings out in the season long guide 
guide by maybe Monday, maybe Wednesday or, or a week from today or some shit like that. So we already have all the dynasty and rookie rankings in there. We are going to do the season long rankings. My first initial rankings, the first time I'm putting them out there, this will be available only to y'all draft guide purchasers. And we got a ridiculously good deal on the draft guides this year. If you have bought the guide already, if you have done it last year, make sure you, you cop it again this year. We are sponsored by Monkey Knife Fight this time around, the draft guide. So if you go to their website as a first-time depositor, you got to be in one of their eligible states to do it, monkeyknifefight.com. All you got to do is use the promo code BDGE when you deposit $10 or more, and you're getting $10 to play with on their site plus an extra $10 because they do a 100% deposit match. You're getting the season-long guide. You're getting the rookie guide. You're getting the dynasty guide. You're getting Dr. Morse's injury guide, which will be in the big dog's guide. You're getting all this shit for $10. It's a ridiculous deal that we work extremely hard on to get out to y'all. So if you do cop it, I'm going to put my first rendition of the rankings in there, which will be up inside a week. So you'll actually know who my wide receiver 12 is rather than me, me just fucking clickbaiting you on and giving you blue balls right now. I want y'all to drop that down below who your wide receiver 12 is. I'm curious because there are a lot of names here. Things start getting messy. Things start getting dicey. You let me know where we're at right now, fantasy world. Let me know where the big dogs are at. Wide receiver 12, drop that comment down below. For all y'all that do that, if you stuck around this long, I will be giving away one draft guide per episode. We do five videos a week. Going forward, I will be giving away one draft guide every single episode to y'all that do comment. Anytime I ask y'all to comment down below and you do so, you're automatically entered into the draft guide giveaway. But I just feel like you should just go to Monkey Knife Fight and support the brand and cop it for 10 bucks and use promo code BDG and all that good shit. While you're down there, hit that thumbs up button because I love you and hopefully you love me. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Again, five fantasy videos a week, if not six when the summer starts to ramp up. I hope y'all enjoyed. As always, Always, nothing but love from the headquarters see you tomorrow on fade the public oh we got a good fucking episode for tomorrow i'm excited for you guys to see that